A lot of these movements proliferate across education because they promise better, faster, quicker results. And the trick is most learning can't be better faster. It is a long process that we have to go through. And when we throw kids into the deep end, instead of teaching them how to swim, let's use the last thousand years of understanding to make this process easier for you. If we just intuitively hope they're gonna figure out swimming, we're gonna lose a lot of them along the way. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called Myths That Undermine Maths Teaching by Powell and colleagues. Now to understand this paper, we have to take a brief look at comprehension. Now this term is most often used in the field of literacy, so let's just start there, reading comprehension. Now believe it or not, reading comprehension isn't a skill. It's not something that we can directly teach. It's something that emerges from two foundations. And those foundations are decoding and knowledge. If you have these two foundations, comprehension will follow. So consider English. I can decode the written word and I have deep knowledge of this language, so I can absolutely comprehend this sentence. But move to Latin. I can decode these words just fine, but I have absolutely no knowledge of Latin language or vocabulary, so I can't comprehend this sentence. Or jump to Japanese. I know that domo arigato means thank you very much. I have that knowledge. But I have no ability to decode and tell you if that's what this sentence says. So no comprehension. So we have decoding plus knowledge equals comprehension. Now believe it or not, this is the same basic process that drives mass. They just use different terms. So instead of decoding, we typically say computational procedures. Instead of knowledge, we typically say numerical concepts. And instead of reading comprehension, of course, we say maths comprehension. So again, these two things lead to this thing. Now, why does any of this matter? This matters because back in the 90s, a movement started that aimed to basically abolish computational procedures. The argument was put forward that so long as kids had a deep enough conceptual understanding of math and enough time to kind of play and experiment, then they could develop their own intuitive procedures and they could build math comprehension by themselves. Now this movement started what was termed the math wars of the late 90s. But luckily by the turn of the century, researchers had clearly established that math, just like reading, is far from intuitive. In fact, the brain naturally uses a logarithmic system in order to compute quantities, whereas traditional math requires a linear scale, something the brain doesn't like to do. And with this understanding came the end of the math wars. Or so I thought. It has recently been brought to my attention that the math wars are back. The argument is again being put forward that all kids need is a deep conceptual understanding of math and they'll be able to intuitively develop their own procedures which will lead to better, deeper math comprehension. So that's where this paper comes in. These authors aim to address the budding math wars by hitting seven what they call myths that can ultimately hinder math's learning when it comes to students. Now we don't have time to hit all seven, but I think there are two that are really cool that we should tap into. So myth number one says this, concepts must come before procedures. Now, as we just saw, we need both concepts and procedures if we want math comprehension to emerge, but which comes first, the concepts or the procedures? And the trick is neither. We do them in tandem. Concepts feed into procedures, procedures feed into concepts. Perhaps the easiest way to see this is to go back to reading. Think of a child trying to sound out a word, d, a, g, And then they have that aha moment, dog, that's a word I know. In this instance, their knowledge of the word dog helped them make sense of and actually drive their decoding ability. And it goes the other way as well. Once kids know how to decode, if they ever hit an idea or a word they don't understand, they can use their decoding ability to make sense of what that word might mean, and now they get a deeper concept. So the same is with math. If I know addition is bringing numbers together, that might help me make sense of what's happening when my teacher says two plus two equals four. And once I have computation down, maybe then I can add 20 plus 20. That helps me develop the concept that, hey, it's not just single numbers I can add, I can add double or triple numbers as well. So procedures and concepts go hand in hand. When we think about teaching them, it's not which do we do in which order, it's how do we do them both simultaneously so one feeds off of the other. Which leads us into myth number two, which says that explicitly teaching algorithms or procedures is harmful for math learning. And the idea is this, that once students intuit how to do the procedures, 
then we can bring in the more standard algorithms and that'll give them more flexibility to do math in the future. But the problem with that is here, all the research shows that once kids understand basic algorithms, they use those, even if that comes after their initial self-invented procedures. And more importantly, when kids use algorithms instead of their own ideas, it's far more effective and moves a whole lot faster. So for example, in one study, students were given two years to develop their own math, then taught explicit algorithms. And after being taught those algorithms, 80% of the time, they used the standard algorithm. There was no flexible jumping between strategies. And when they did use the algorithm, they performed 22% better than when they used their own strategies and finished each problem 15 seconds faster. And in another study that looked at over a thousand kids across four grades, whenever kids use a standard algorithm, they performed on average 26% better than when they use their own intuitive algorithms. So, okay then, let's bring this back to us. What does this mean for us as teachers? Well, first, there is no shortcut when it comes to learning. A lot of these movements proliferate across education because they promise better, faster, quicker results. And the trick is most learning can't be better faster. It is a long process that we have to go through. And when we throw kids into the deep end, instead of teaching them how to swim, let's use the last thousand years of understanding to make this process easier for you. If we just intuitively hope they're gonna figure out swimming, we're gonna lose a lot of them along the way. So the next time someone comes out with the next big thing meant to change education, just keep in mind that learning is not always fast, it's not always easy, it is a process, it requires work, and that's okay. If we go through that process, we can all come out the other side. And the second thing then, I think is this importance between concepts and procedures, or knowledge and skills. I can't think of a single field where the two don't work off of each other. Language, math, most sciences, most of the practical subjects. Knowledge on its own sometimes falters. Skills on their own sometimes falter, but bring knowledge and skills together, that's where the things we really care about start to emerge. Things like creativity, critical thinking, comprehension. We don't have to explicitly focus on these bigger outcomes. If we focus on the sub skills and make sure these get locked down, then these bigger skills that we really hope to see will start to emerge from that process. By all means, we will talk about it. We will make sure kids know these higher order thinking things exist. But instead of spending all of our time there hoping to quantum leap kids to that level, we go back to the basics. What are the building blocks that will allow this to emerge? And we focus there. And the third thing is this. It's very popular now to say that education needs a revolution. But when we talk in those terms, wholesale revolution, people tend to swing the pendulum a little too far in any direction. So in this case, we need a revolution. Let's go all concept-based learning. The problem is when that fails, and it will, People are then gonna swing the pendulum too far the other way and say, let's just teach procedures. And that's gonna equally fail. So rather than think revolution, can we start thinking evolution? Instead of working from the premise that education is broken, why don't we accept that 90% of what we do is great? Education has never been better in history than it is right now. More kids have access to it, more kids are succeeding through it, graduation rates are through the roof, ideas of well-being and socialization have never been more prevalent in schools. We are doing great. But just like any field, things can continue to evolve. We can always do better. So rather than thinking, how do we rebuild this whole thing, we can think, what is just one small iterative step I can take each day to make this slightly better? And when we think of small changes, that leads to big results versus trying to make big changes, which often leads to confusion and we lose a lot of people along the way. So evolution over revolution. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that made sense and you got something good from this. If you like what you saw, you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. It'll make sure more people get a chance to see this on YouTube. Otherwise, thank you all so much. I hope you're well and I'll see you at the next one. Bye y'all.